I'm Lindsay with IPO Wines, and today we are here with Matt Dees, who is the winemaker for Honada, the Hilt, and the Pairing, uh, which is a winery located on the central coast of California. So thank you so much for being here today, Matt. Thank you for having Appreciate me. Appreciate it. Um, so could you start off by telling us um, a little bit about the projects you're working on, as well as what differentiates each of the labels? Sure, sure. So Honada is a 600 acre estate in the middle of San Inez Valley. And on that estate, we've got basically the entire Noah's Ark of grapes. We have Sablon, Semillon, Viognier, Grenache, Syrah, Sangiovese, Merlot, Cap Franc, Cap Sav, Petit Verdot, and we just added Petit Syrah. Right. So we've got 11 different varieties in a, a, a climate that is, is kind of marginal for Bordeaux varieties. So basically, Honada is, is wines that are really defined by, by you know, bright California fruit, but definitely a cooler climate backbone of, of acidity, of, of tannin, and Anything with the Honada label is from that estate. We make a wine called the Hilt, which kind of grew out of our love for Burgundy. Uh, the owner, myself, everyone involved really loved Burgundy. And while we realized that we're never going to make Burgundy, we don't want to make Burgundy, we're in California, we thought we're close, very, very close, you know, 12 miles close to the, uh, what we think is the best Pinot Noir and Chardonnay grown region in the United States, Santa Rita Hills. So we thought we give it a shot and try to make wines that were really balanced, elegant, uh, a bit of the darker side of Pinot Noir with some complexity, earthiness, not just, just big fruit. So we started looking for old vines because we knew the only place we would find the balance we were looking for was through old vines. And we kind of were in the right place at the right time and took over 32 acres at Sanford and Benedict, mm -hmm. which is out far, far west, San Rita Hills, undrafted vines, planted in 1972. And the Hilt is really our project of Pinot and Chardonnay based on those old vines. The pairing is the second label of Honada and the Hilt. So we have a pairing red, we have a pairing white, which are based on, on Bordeaux varieties. And then we have pairing Pinot and pairing Chardonnay. I love the pairing. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fan. Too. It's what we drink every night. Um, so how did you get started in the wine industry? I know that you didn't, you know, you grew up in Missouri. Oof. Kansas City, Kansas. Kansas. City of Kansas. Oh. Okay. Um, so, you know, what brought you in, into that industry? You know, it's hard to say exactly what it was, but I, I think the, the driving factor was the fact that I was always a soil geek. Mm -hmm. I was always, from the time I was two, uh, I was a kid out in left field, and I say this all the time, but I'd be out playing baseball, and all of a sudden the coach would be yelling at me because the ball was going flying over my head, and I was picking up bugs and digging up worms and looking at grass and, like, looking at plants. And it's just, it's something that I've always had. So uh, I went to school in Vermont, which is not really a fine wine-making mecca, mm -hmm. but uh, definitely an amazing plant and soil science department. And between my love of wine and my love of plants, the grapevine kind of fell in between there. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of latched on and, and planted a vineyard in Vermont in, with a gentleman in 1998 as a sophomore in college. And just made wine for a number of years, realized I was about 3,000 miles away from where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. So I moved out to Napa Valley, worked with the Stagman family, Worked in New Zealand for a number of years, and in between the ripeness of Napa Valley and the struggle to ripen of New Zealand, I think Santa Barbara County, San Inez Valley specifically, is kind of right in between those two. It's just, you can ripen fruit, but again, you, you maintain acidity and structure. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's like the region that you're going to stay in? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I know that the soils um, at the winery are very poor and sandy, and um, when you guys decided to start planting, um, some of the people who surveyed the land told you guys to stay away from grapes. You know, that wasn't going to work out and you should just plant asparagus. So how do you deal with these poor soils to uh, still create these beautiful wines? Yeah, you know, that, that definitely lit a fire under us when people told us to plant asparagus and another consultant told us that the soils were very good, but good for golf, not good for wine, which is yeah. awesome. One of my favorite things anyone's ever said. Uh, but even as a soil scientist, I'll be honest, I looked at the soils and was very skeptical because we have this preconceived notion that sand doesn't work. Sand doesn't work for fine wines. It's something we're kind of taught, something that's ingrained in us. There's no soul in sand. I hear that a lot. In reality, sand is, to me, now that I've worked with it for, for you know, going on 10 years, it's the ideal soil for fine wines. I mean, it, it is, there's no nutrient, very little. There is very little water holding capacity. And so you naturally have vines that struggle. You naturally have vines that don't produce large, uh, large yields. So it's very 
non-interventional, non-manipulative viticultural work. I mean, it, it, the vines really basically take care of themselves, stay very small, the clusters stay very small, and very few and far between. Uh, the berries are very small. It's been a trick for us to manage water, um, and we're really trying to cut back every single year. So actually right now there are about, I think out of the 82 acres, there's about 15 acres that are dry farmed on pure sand. Um, there's nothing impeding the roots going down, so they travel very quickly to find water down there. And it's a learning process, but for us, the soil absolutely defines these wines. The fine tannin, the intensity of fruit, the, the, the level of tannin, there's so much tannin, but it's so fine. It's all very, very much uh, correlated with the same. Um, and I know, so you have all these different projects that you're working on. You're working with so many different varietals. Um, I think a lot of your wines are, um, you know, just absolutely spectacular. What, what philosophy do you use um, in your winemaking approach? Sure, sure. You, you know, everyone's going to say this. Everyone's going to say, you know, we're just farmers. We just you know, we look at the soil. We don't you know, try to imprint these wines. And, and, and that's really what we do. Uh, I think that, you know, with these wines, I tried to do something else the first year. I tried to, I just come down from Napa, so I tried to extract. I tried to, you know, because I was so used to tannins that almost melted. Uh, in cab, you know, they're so sweet, there really wasn't any, any grip to them. And so you could extract and pull everything out in the ferment. So I came down here and tried that with these wines that are so tannic. It's a far colder climate than that one. And I lost that battle. Um, I mean, some of the wines were, were you know, so tannic that to be undrinkable. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to really draw back. And I think the one thing that, that we do now that's different the most is because of the tannic content of our grapes, the level of ripeness that we get, the seeds that are never quite ripe. We're one of the only, only wineries in the world that probably does this, but we actually try not to extract. So we cold soak as long as we can. We try to extract cold with no alcohol. Once we start getting into warm ferments with, with more alcohol content, we'll pump over once a day for one minute. And that's something that's really been a big deal. But philosophically speaking, I learned on the job winemaking, and I feel that, that winemaking is really a lot of intuition. Mm. It's listening to the vines, it's listening to the climate, it's listening to the vintage, it's, it's listening to your intuition as well. Uh, we're really not that technologically savvy, <laughs> especially me. So we do things, we still try, you know, trump, uh, or uh, tread on, on the grapes, stomp on the grapes. Um, we don't crush anything. We, we don't go as far as not using pumps or anything like that, but we don't really look at numbers, we don't really do analysis on the grapes because I feel like it can cloud your judgment on when to pick. Um, but, yeah. So it seems like you kind of use that like old school approach. We do, we do. We, we certainly use the older school approach within the confines of, of being diligent. Right. And keeping things clean. Right. Yeah. Um, so the last question I like to um, ask at the end of an interview is, what is your favorite bottle of wine, and what song would you pair it with? What's my favorite bottle of wine, what song would I pair it with? Wow, that's a really good question. Favorite bottle of wine, give me wider red. Oh no, I won't even do that. <laughs> that's not fair. Uh, the most amazing wine I've had in the last year was a wine that I thought I'd be really greatly disappointed by because the critics panned it, it was a terrible vintage and all these things. Uh, it would have been the 2008 Klopp Kornas. Um, which I thought was incredible. Um, I also had recently the, the 74 Maya Kamas, and both those wines to me were kind of defined by this, uh, this structure that you couldn't really forget. They were incredibly tannic wines, but they were incredibly forgiving in the tannin. They weren't really so grippy and, and out of balance with tannin that, that you would forget about the fruit, but, but the tannin was certainly evident and, and strong character. When I listened to it with it's a tough call. If I was drinking the bottles, I'd probably want to kick back and listen to something I'm, I'm loving right now. Okay. And it wouldn't be new, because I haven't heard anything good new for like 10 years. I hear that. 15 years. <laughs> hmm. I'd probably sit back and listen to Coltrane. John Coltrane, um, I'm old fashioned from Blue Train. All right. Yeah, it sounds really good. Yeah, yeah. actually. I like that. <laughs> to right. be specific. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like, I, I need you to be specific. <laughs> All right. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It was great talking with you. Yeah, thank you.